I always laugh when I do that. Sorry, guys. Hey, let's pray for a second. God, we thank you that you speak to our hearts. We thank you that you are present in our lives. We thank you for the word that you offer. And I ask now that you would help me and all of us to surrender, that we might hear from you what it is that you have to say. Help us also to be courageous in listening. Amen. That last part, we might need to pray again. I'm going to ask you individually to be courageous. The, the passage we're going to look at in Acts today, Acts chapter 15, is it is a passage that can make a big difference in your heart if you listen to it about yourself. It can also make you think all kinds of things about other people if you try to apply it to somebody else. It's about us, and, and it is, I think it is a revealing and powerful passage, and I think it's important that, that we all be willing to let it mess just a bit with who we are, with what we believe and, and what we've experienced. And I say that because the, the church has a responsibility that is also a privilege. The responsibility is to share the name of Jesus Christ. The privilege is that Jesus turned the tables on all human behavior and all of religious practice. No longer do you have to adhere to a certain set of standards and behaviors in order to qualify for salvation. And it's important because it's tragic. I hear people all the time saying, I think he was good enough. I think I'm good enough. I think they're good enough to get into heaven. Folks, here's the bad news. None of us are. You'll never meet a person whose behavior will qualify them for eternity with Christ in heaven. It doesn't happen. I don't care how good they are. And, and the tragic part of that is, I know that truth. It's my responsibility to share with others what the possibilities are. Because if my behavior can't offer me hope, where is hope? And if you look around and you ask yourself, are the people around me hopeful people? If you find that the people around you aren't hopeful people, it's probably because they've looked at their own behavior and they don't believe that their resources, combined with the circumstances around them, offer them a, a view of the future which is hopeful. In other words, it's either someplace I can't get because I don't have the opportunity or the resources, or it's someplace that doesn't exist. I don't see it. And so hope is the issue. Hope is the issue in the gospel. And the, the central piece of this is that once we have the hope that Jesus Christ offers to us and it begins to change our lives and we begin to live in ways that are new and different and powerful and we begin to see that we can rise above some things, then unfortunately we sometimes lose sight of the truth that we are only saved by grace and not by anything we do. We can do good things and be a blessing to God and be a blessing to others. But whether I, you know, a, as a pastor or as a lay person, before I knew Christ, there was no hope for me to have an eternity. There was no hope for me to rise above the abilities that I had. And let's face it, I was born into a, a place of relative privilege and I have a I mean, they don't all show. I mean, a, lot, a lot of times they're hidden. But I do have some qualities that are halfway decent. And I have some abilities that are not completely wasteful. They don't always apply in the places I end up. But the reality is, I wasn't without ability. And so there was a part of my life I didn't realize that I, that I couldn't earn salvation. I didn't even know it. I didn't know that, there was, that, I, that I needed grace. And so that is just as hopeless to be under the impression that I can just do things myself. And yeah, I mean, it's true. In middle school, I don't think this would apply. But for the rest of my life, I was probably better than the people around me. Or at least I could convince myself that I wasn't as bad as some of the people that I saw. That I didn't do those things. You know what I mean? Like I, if I wanted to come up with an argument that Russ was a good enough guy to make it into heaven, if good guys could make it into heaven, I could come up with that argument. Of course, it's complete poppycock. I'm not good enough and I really probably wasn't nearly as good as I thought I was. And I, I told you this before, right? The, my, the test that we use for my mother's dementia is that she remembered that I was a wonderful child in middle school. 
And she says no instantly. There's no hesitation. So we know she's still in connect, connected to some kind of reality. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. She loves me anyway. And folks, there isn't a better metaphor for what it means to be a believer in Christ than that. You know what? In, in terms of, I don't know how you were in middle school, but I could imagine, because I was there and none of us were human. There was, there was not a human being in that entire generation, that, that age range. That's when we stop being human and we start trying to figure out what we are. But there are people who still love us. I've always admired middle school school workers because they love kids that most of the rest of the world is saying, and that's on their best days, right? My mom loved me in the midst of my most ridiculous and indescribable behavior. And that's what Jesus does for us. He loves us when we're acting our worst and believing that we're at our best. Because that's the conundrum of that middle school time. That's the conundrum. I was a complete moron and I thought I was on top of the world. I thought I had everything figured out and I had nothing figured out and I didn't even know that I didn't have anything figured out. Spiritually, that's where we come to Christ. We think we've got everything figured out, but we don't have it figured out. And he loves us into the place of getting it. And we begin to get it. That's what we find in Acts chapter 15. So I'm gonna read this to you, starting at the beginning of, of um, chapter 15, verse one. This is a fairly long passage. It's a narrative that I want you to hear. So I'm gonna read all of it up through verse um, 20. So hang on with me and <clears throat> hear it as a story. I'll, tr I'll try to read, I'll try to slow down some. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Now remember, Antioch is that, that place where the church is first called Christian. Antioch is a place where the church begins to blossom, begins to really grow. And if you didn't know, if you don't remember this, for a couple of weeks ago we talked about Antioch. Antioch is the most cosmopolitan location in the Middle East. This is, this is like Las Vegas and New York City combined. This is all kinds of people and all kinds of cultures and all kinds of wealth and all kinds of experiences. So this is a major metropolitan area with all kinds of diversity. And that's where the church begins. Understand this, there are no accidents in the story of the church. What we have in the book of Acts is what God wants us to pay attention to about the way this whole thing got started and what powers it. And you can't find the church alive without the Holy Spirit and without the witness of the gospel. Those things are essential. The settings, however, also matter. So Antioch, there were some folks come down from Judea to Antioch and they were teaching the believers and here's what they were teaching them. They were teaching them that they were doing it wrong. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Folks, this is a place where a statement in the Bible is an absolute lie. That statement, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved, is a lie. Now, it's not God saying it, he's saying there are others teaching this, but this is absolutely unequivocally untrue. And before we take another step, we need to all confess that there's something in our makeup and our belief that falls in that category of things that keep people from being saved. They're usually not the things that bother us personally, but we all have stuff in that little, that little box that we hold off as the people who can't be saved and that's, that's just, a, that's a reality that we're in the process of being redeemed. We're not fully redeemed. It is not hopeless. It is just the truth about who we are. These folks came down from Judea. They came down from where the beginning, where the center of Judaism was. Remember this. Christian faith doesn't have any identity without Jesus, and Jesus doesn't have any meaning without being the Messiah, and the Messiah is an Old Testament Jewish concept. This, the only scripture we have at the point of, of time in Antioch is the Old Testament as we see it. So this is thoroughly a Jewish experience, and these folks are simply coming down trying to make sure 
that the, that the folks who have heard about Jesus do it the right way because they're afraid that maybe they're going to be polluting or diluting the faith. And so they've come down to try to teach them the right way and they say, you've got to live, you've got to be circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you can't be saved. I can promise you this, these were adult men making this, this um, teaching. Not just because they were the only ones that taught, but they were the only ones who were circumcised. And that happened when they were eight days old. They don't remember it and they didn't have to choose it. That's an important thing to recognize. The quality of being circumcised is not a spiritual challenge to any of the ones who are teaching it at this point. They do not have to make a decision to do this. They didn't ever get to make a decision to do this. And it's not a real factor in their life. It's their history. Just like I was born in North America. It's no merit to me that that's where I was born. I was born in Washington, D.C. That's because that's where my parents lived. Not because I was some wonderful person. There is nothing about being circumcised other than the fact that your parents obeyed the law. Okay, doesn't have anything to do with the individual. There is no obedience that goes along with it. And in fact, in Jeremiah in particular, God says, listen, in, a, in just a little while, I'm gonna open your eyes and see how I'm gonna punish those who have been circumcised in the flesh, but not in the heart. In other words, they have the mark of faith, but they're not living it. This is, what's, this is what they're carrying into to Antioch. They say, Unless you're circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you can't be saved. Now let's continue on. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Now remember, Paul was, an, Paul was a Pharisee. He was one, one of the people that would have been circumcised. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. So they had a conversation with the larger church to say, what does this mean for us? And this question, the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled, listen to what they did. As they traveled, they told about how the Gentiles had been converted. So even in the process of going to figure this thing out, they're witnessing about how lives have been changed by the power of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit in those lives. This news made all the believers very glad. We're not alone in having our lives changed. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So it's not about this one controversy. It's about God is still alive and well and working through us. When you have stories about how lives have been changed through your witness, it keeps everything in the proper perspective. This is how the church is intended to live. <clears throat> Then some of the believers that belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So now it's not just circumcision and custom, it's now the whole law of Moses. And newsflash, in case you didn't know this, but as of this moment in scripture, those Pharisees that stood up and said, keep the law of Moses, were a part of a population that had precisely zero people throughout all of history that were able to actually keep the law of Moses. So right now, the number of people that fall in that category is zero. But they think it ought to apply for everybody else because they're on the inside and it's not applying to them. The apostles and the elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. So know this, Peter is not starting a movement, nor is he claiming that he's gonna do something different. He's saying, listen, God moved in us. God took me from a place of not wanting to be open to this. If you remember Peter's story, Peter was not in favor of this. He wanted to keep the law. He's the guy that sit, stood, he was praying on top of the house and three times God left down the sheet and said, hey, eat from this. And Peter said, no, I won't touch that. That's unclean food. And God said, Peter, don't, don't call anything unclean that I have made clean. So this is Peter saying, listen, believers have come to faith, not through behaving according to the law of Moses, 
but by being made clean through the grace of Jesus Christ. God has touched their lives. Peter says, listen, I didn't understand that to begin with, but God changed us. God changed me to to let me know that the Gentiles were the people that God wanted to reach out to. In fact, he continues, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. So there's evidence in their lives that their lives have been changed. They gave their lives to Jesus Christ. They were changed and saved by grace and grace has made a difference in who they are. They don't, we don't stay like we are when we're saved. We begin to get sanctified. God is working within us, but we don't ever all get perfect and complete instantly and it takes time. It is a life lived of sanctification. We grow in holiness, yes, but it's a step-by-step, day-by-day thing, and we don't ever get there. It is a journey and a battle and a struggle, and the sinful stuff in our lives needs to be addressed, but it has to be addressed when we're willing to cooperate with God and work on it. So until I grew up from middle school and got a little bit older and my hormones changed and then my attitude changed, it took me a long time to be able to look my mom in the eye and honestly say, I was a freak in middle school, wasn't I? I, the evidence was there in everybody else's eyes and my father tried to tell me and my sister rolled her eyes and learned how not to live in middle school and so she escaped a whole lot of the stuff that I went through but the reality is until I recognized that I needed to grow up from that stuff, nothing changed. Nothing changes until we cooperate with the Holy Spirit to work in our lives the redemption that we're facing at that moment. The challenge that you need to face is the step of faith in front of you. And don't for one second believe that God's asking you or me to pick out what the challenge is for somebody else. What we need to do is encourage one another like they're doing here. They're having a conversation about what matters, about what we need to pay attention to. They're not saying anything goes and they're not saying only the law goes because nobody can live according to the law. It doesn't happen, okay? And so Peter says, listen, God showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by, and here's the key, this is the, this is the thing that we all need to remember because it was true then and it will be true forever. By putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. That yoke is perfect adherence to the complete law. That is not to say that the law doesn't matter. It simply is to say that our ancestors had multiple opportunities and multiple witnesses and multiple redemptions to go back to trying to live according to the law and not one single person was able to behave that way. And Peter says, listen, why are we telling them that for them to be saved, they have to follow something that we could never be saved? But listen, what he's really pointing out in verse 10, and this is a critical piece, now then, why do you try to test God? You see, when I demand of you a behavior that I think is right for you and you haven't said, listen, if you've come to me and said, you know, Russ, I'm struggling with this behavior. I'm struggling with this attitude. I'm struggling with this issue in my life. Can you talk to me about it? Can we pray about it? Can you be along with me and walk with me in this? Then that's legit. That is mutual accountability. And that is very, very much what it means to live in a Christian faith. But if I just go to you and say, listen, here's what you must do or must not do and how you must do it and how you must not do it. If I tell you how you must give, who you can talk to, who you can care about, where you can go, what you can do, whether you can dance, drink, or play cards, if I start telling you that stuff, I'm not testing you. I'm testing God because I'm now building a roadblock. And this is critical because I'm a leader in the church. These are leaders in the church. As a leader in the church, people are supposed to trust that I've taken time to pray about these things and put them before God, and it's about God empowering my ministry. So if I start doing this stuff, I'm testing God, and guess what's gonna happen? God's gonna pull out of my ministry. God's gonna leave me on my own to do this thing, and you can accomplish an awful lot with human effort, but what you can't accomplish 
like we talked about before. It doesn't matter how big the church could get, how many people give, how much money you give to me, how much money you pay me, or how much money we give away. It doesn't matter how many great, wonderful people that never get caught doing anything wrong come in the doors of the church. We cannot be saved by anybody's actions. We can only be saved by the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And folks, he did that for me long before I even cared about his name. And I spoke his name in church many times without knowing what he had done for me. It wasn't until I allowed him to become my savior by surrendering to that, that his grace began to work in me. And that's the only thing that gives me any authority to speak about what faith means in anybody's life. And so Peter says, we're gonna test God if we put this in front of them. Now, no, he says, verse 11, we believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done through the Gentiles, with, among the Gentiles, through them. So again, it's not just can they join the church and we don't see any change. They're talking about changed lives. They see the evidence of how God's worked in their lives. But folks, we don't see what we're not looking for. And if I don't look at your life looking for the evidence of how God is working change and how grace is making an impact in who you are, if I look for evidence of law breaking, if I look for evidence of sin, I guarantee you I will find it because none of us are perfect. But you know, here's the challenge. I ask this oftentimes of folks. Say, do you believe that you're perfect, that, you're, that you've lived, lived a sinful existence? No. Do you believe that we all sin and that we still sin even as believers? Absolutely. Do you believe that we can just ignore our sin? No, I don't. So tell me, this morning since you got up, do you believe that you have sinned? Yeah, I probably have. So what are those sins? What, what have you to confess between when you woke up this morning and now? See, here's the problem. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not, I'm not scolding you for not doing that. My point is this. The sin that we need to pay more attention to is our own, and what we do with it is not ignore it, not assimilate it, but bring it to God and say, you know what, God? I'm challenged by this. I'm redeemed, yes, for eternity, but I'm not living it yet. And here's the thing that bothers me. And I gotta tell you, when you find something like that and you begin to work on it, it takes a long time and a lot of surrender to get it to the right place. But we still have not noticed all the challenges in our own lives and recognize sin is not just, it's not about doing bad stuff, it's about the stuff that keeps me separated from God. So getting distracted into my own stuff and skipping my quiet time or cutting short the amount of time I spend reading the Bible or praying for somebody else because I got something else to go, that I, that I would prefer to do, that might be considered sin because it's separating me from God. See, it's not about doing bad stuff. It's about the stuff that gets me closer to who God is. And Peter says, listen, we've seen the, the fruit of the gospel in their lives. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. And so James brings in scripture. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. This is the kingdom of God that, that Jesus brings back in in the name of David. This is David's authority in the name of Christ. And I, in its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of humankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. And then Simon says, or then, yeah, Simon says, it's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And then he makes this note. Instead, and this is a mark of decorum, this is a challenge. This is to say, listen, we're not gonna give up on everything. We're not gonna say anything goes. Let's focus on a few things that matter. And I would just like to point out that these things are not necessarily things that matter to us today, although some are. He says, instead, we'll tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols, I don't know if that's a challenge for anyone that I know of anyway. From sexual immorality, I know a lot of folks that would believe that they're not challenged by that, but they're not telling the truth. If you look at what Jesus' standard is, it's your thought world that can cause you as much trouble as what you do. So what you do on the outside might appear to be just perfect, but what's happening on the inside 
might not be very well, uh, very much honoring God's standard. So it might be something that, that many people still struggle with. From meat of strangled animals and from blood, from, for the law of Moses had been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on the Sabbath. The point there is, it's not the whole law, it's the quorum. It is still important for us to try to bring our lives in line with what God has said because ultimately, a life aligned with God's standard is a life that is more blessed than one that isn't. It is just not necessary for salvation and more importantly, I can't grow in my faith, I can't face my challenges if I'm doing it on my own. I need you guys around around me going through similar challenges, maybe not exactly the same thing, but we're all in this together saying, today, if I take the next step of faith, when I wake up tomorrow, grace will greet me and I'll have a story to tell about how God got me through this day and maybe the next day and the next day and the next day. And then when I meet somebody who says, times have been tough, I can say to them, I get that. It's not easy to live this faith. And it's, it's even harder to live life without faith. And so we face the reality of what's happening in our lives and the truth of what matters most. And this is the bottom line, if the praise team would like to come up. This is the bottom line, folks. This, this passage is about not losing the plot. Have you ever watched you know, the, the worst of the worst B-grade movies? You know what happens in all of them? They don't lose the plot. You ask if there even is a plot. Where are you going with this? Watch this, started watching a B-grade movie about um, a cyborg cop. And, and in the opening, the, the, the commentary at the opening said, never in the movie is there a cyborg cop that ever appears. Then it's true. The title says one thing, the movie says something completely different. And it is, it, I watch it because of humor. I laugh at it. Folks, that's not, that's not who we should be. We shouldn't be a church that says Jesus Christ on the outside but acts like the law of Moses on the inside. We shouldn't be a church that says grace out of one side of our mouth and law out of the other side of our mouth. We're either saved by grace or we're not. What's happening in Acts, now that they're going out and they're sharing the gospel with other people and they're seeing that they're, the world is not all homogenous, that not everybody is a Jew that understands everything that goes along with being a Jew, that now there's some changes and some challenges and some risks and they're saying, listen, Let's don't lose the plot. Let's don't become a, a, a caricature of what it means to be God's people. If we're saved by grace through faith, then let's let that be the thing that's most obvious about all that we do and all that we say. I think it's a good way to live. Let's pray. God, thank you. Help us not to lose the plot. Amen.